from the vault, high atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hello, everyone. This is your Talking Catholic co-host, Mary McCusker. And as always, I'm here with Michael Walsh, and we're currently recording this podcast on Friday, December 11th, which means that Christmas is exactly two weeks away. Oh, no. I've literally How, done no shopping. Are you in the Christmas spirit, Mike? You know, <laughs> as uh, as, we, as I mentioned right before we got we, uh, we started to record, uh, December is the busiest time of year for me, it, 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 professionally. Uh, Lent is is also busy, and, and uh, Catholic school graduations is very busy. But Advent, December, Christmas time, always the busiest for me so I'm bouncing around all over the diocese usually most years I'd be going to all these different parishes or having events but since the communications department is now live streaming a lot of stuff and mm-hmm. creating a lot of stuff for the parishes I'm out doing our stuff so I literally raced here from a site visit at another entity so to answer your question what was your question <laughs> I, I literally I are literally, you in the Christmas spirit I, and how are you and I guess well, I'm told that Advent is a, has a Lenten quality to it. So, if uh, self sacrifice and uh, you know, kind of beating yourself down a little bit is part of Advent, then yes, I'm definitely in the Advent. Of the, but I'm not in Christmas yet. But as I always tell people, Christmas doesn't start till the 25th, so you don't really need to get into the Christmas spirit until the 25th. Right now, I'm in the Advent spirit, and it's also like 61 degrees or something outside, so it's a little hard to yeah. really feel it full. Force. That is that is a little rough. <laughs> And that's funny, Mike, because you actually remind me a lot of our guest today, who also seems to be so busy and active and involved in all sorts of activities in our diocese. And both of you always make me wonder, how on earth do they have time to do all of this? Except I think our guest does everything with a little bit more joy. joy. (laughs) Yes, joy in his heart. (laughs) Wait, is is doing it with bitter and anger not the same as doing it with joy? I I don't know. But uh, no, actually, I'm very excited about our our guest being on here today uh, because I am looking to pick up some tips from him. Uh, Also, we should also probably mention that uh, this is a rarity for us. It's the first time in a long time we've been able to record in person. So I hope you're enjoying the better sound quality, and we are actually enjoying being together. At a distance. a distance, but we're we're together, so we're very excited about yes. that. So, Mary, who is with us today? So I'm happy to welcome David Tanzola, who is a dear friend of Catholic Charities and somebody who wears a lot of different hats and roles in his parish and in his personal and professional life and is just a genuinely warm and humble and inspiring person in general. So welcome, Dave. How are you doing? Thank you, Mary. I'm doing great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, you're one of the people in our diocese who just seems, like I said, so involved in so many different things. You volunteer with Catholic charities. You, you know, in your parish, you lead a lot of different initiatives. So I wanted to kind of dive into some of that and ask you some questions. Sure. So, Dave, uh, which parish is yours? I uh, the Catholic Community that. of the Holy Spirit in, in, in Mullica Hill, Mullica Hill, Woodstown area. Woodstown. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's. I'm from that neck of the woods. Uh, I live in Glassboro now, but I grew up in the Woodstown area with a lot of family in that general vicinity. Okay. So I always. Plus, I I must say for anyone who doesn't know, Mullica Hill is one of the prettiest towns in South Jersey, and I was very happy even during COVID times. They did a wonderful job with uh, uh they had their their f- like Friday night business night on an early December, and huh. I was very happy to see a everybody wearing their masks and B, just how crowded it was. The businesses did a great job. So if you've never been to Mullica Hill, I encourage you to. I've only to come been down. there. Have you lived there your whole life, Dave? I have. I actually grew up just up the road in Mantua, but my wife and I moved to Mullica Hill in 1989. So yeah, it's oh, my okay. home. Yeah. So it's a great place. So a little, little plug for our uh, for South Jersey. Nice. <laughs> so Dave, can you tell us a little bit about? Um, and I know we talked about this before, but I found it to be such a fascinating story. Um, you know, how did you come about to be, um, you know, this faithful, active Catholic in our diocese? I know it was a, a journey sure. <laughs> and one that I didn't know about till we spoke the other day, but can you share that with us? Sure. I'd be happy to. And uh, yes, it, it has been a journey. Um, just to give you a little background on myself, as, a, as we mentioned, I was born and raised in, in Mantua, Mullica Hill. I'm a Clearview graduate, mm-hmm. South Jersey boy. All right. Uh, and uh, I actually was uh, converted. I converted to being Catholic when I was 30. Uh, oh, but wow. I was born and raised in the Presbyterian Church at Woodbury. 
My parents were very active in that church. I was baptized and confirmed there. So for the first 30 years of my life, my faith foundation was built in the Presbyterian Church. Yeah. Um, a wonderful community still to this day. My wife and I go back every December, although we'll miss it this December because Aww. of COVID. Sure. They welcome us back uh, for a special Advent program that they have. We worship together. I get to see a lot of old friends. They get to meet my children. Um, and it has been such a great experience to have that connection from back in the very beginning of my faith formation. Um, yeah. I met my wife when I was 18 years old. We Aww. were uh, working together in one summer in Philadelphia at the business that we now both own mm -hmm. with the other family members, uh, Steel Fabrication Company. Right. Uh, and we couldn't be any more different back then <laughs> than two people who meet for the first time. I'm Presbyterian wow. from South Jersey and of a mixed ethnic group. I have part Irish, part German, Dutch, and part Italian. Mm. Huh. My wife is Catholic from Philadelphia and 100% Italian. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so <laughs> really, was, it, was it meant to be that we were gonna get married like day one? Because <laughs> it seemed that way. So um, the connection to my journey, the journey to becoming Catholic and where I am today started with my wife, Anita. Yeah. Um, we Who was lovely, by the way. I've met her multiple times, <laughs> and she is just a delight. Yeah, Mary was saying that uh, perhaps a future podcast she'll be on, because uh, the two of you are quite the dynamo together. <laughs> I said she could have her own podcast, oh, right. because I, yes. both of you each have your own backgrounds. and like. You know. uh, the, she would call it Fridays with Anita, I think. You know, she oh, would have a name ready to she go. She could run so a careful. podcast. I'm always, I'm always looking at podcasts of the channel, so I might reach out to her for that. <laughs> your phone may be ringing right now, Mike, so be ready. <laughs> okay, I'll wait. <laughs> But she really is um, and has been for me such a life force, such a, a, um, a strength in, in, um, in helping to form me, helping to, to guide me. Uh, and together, our marriage has been something that I really do, uh, I feel so blessed yeah. to be a part of. So we've spent uh, 37 years in marriage. We've spent 37 years really in one way, shape or form celebrating that grace and paying it back. Right. And that's what that's what we learn. That's what we know. And that's what feels right to us. Right. Um, so the story goes that um, in 1978, we had our first date, Labor Day weekend. Uh, and uh, the, the courtship continued for about five years until we decided to get married. Um, one of the things that would happen because of where we lived, I lived in, in Mullica Hill, Mantua, and my wife lived in uh, West Philadelphia near uh, the St. Charles Seminary. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Her, uh, her family lived out there. It was about a 50-minute ride from door to door. So a typical Saturday night date night would be that I would travel out there around dinner time and have dinner with her family. And then she and I would go out, go out on a date for the evening, go to the movies, visit some friends, go to a party. And then I was welcome to stay over and go to mass with them the next morning. Hmm. And I would usually hang around if it was the fall. We watched the Eagles with her brothers and her dad, or we'd play street hockey. And it, we made, I kind of made a day out of it. Yeah. Um, well, it got to the point where I was attending mass very frequently. So, and enjoying it. Our Lady of Lord's Parish, 63rd in Lancaster. <laughs> so oh. I got to become friendly with the priest, the deacons, many of the other parishioners. They got to know, they'd see me right there. And Anita's the oldest of six children. Wow. So it was her parents and six children and me. And so, what was it like when you first, your, your first exposure or mass, was it, you know, whoa, this is different? Yes. Or? <laughs> Mary, very, very much different. so. The rituals, the kneeling, yeah. the prayers. Oh, okay. It's uh, always the kneeling when you first go to a Catholic mass. Because oh I come yeah. from a, my family is Protestant on one side and, and Catholic. So every time there's a wedding, they're like, oh, that's right. I got to kneel. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was very intimidating. But thankfully, there were so many of them around me. I knew exactly what did. I just looked at them. <laughs> up, yep. yeah. It's follow their so, lead. Five, about five years of courtship before we, we got engaged and got married. So the story goes um, that uh, on our wedding day, uh, the, uh, my wife and I had planned for, for the wedding, and uh, we invited my pastor, Reverend Craven, from the Presbyterian Church of Woodbury to participate. Mm. And on the wedding day, um, Anita's grandmother and aunt are sitting in the front row, and the story goes that uh, her grandmother leans over to her aunt and says, who's the gentleman in the royal blue robe on the altar? And Aunt Gemma says, that's oh. Dave's minister. And Grandmom says, what? He's not Catholic. <laughs> because she belonged to that parish and saw me there almost every weekend. For, oh, my gosh. Of course, I was kidding her at the reception saying, I bet you cut the, the check in half for the gift. <laughs> 
<laughs> and she laughed. But the truth was, many of her family didn't even know I wasn't Catholic. Oh my oh. gosh! Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> on, surprise. On the wedding Nin- day. So that's November of 1983. Wow. And um, five years later. Um, uh, we decided, my, my wife and I were going to have our first child, our boy, and I was really confronted with the idea that I'd be going to my church and she'd be going to Mass. Yeah. So uh, at the time, we had bought a house. We lived in Woodbury, and we, she was a member of St. Pat's, and it was right around the corner from Presbyterian Church. So a typical Sunday morning would be we'd blo- I'd park in the middle, she would go right a block, I'd go left <laughs> a block, and I'd see her after Mass. My parents were at church, we'd go out to breakfast. And it worked for a number of years up until when she was going to have our son. Yeah. yeah. And that's when I really decided, you know what, I have to think about this. Right. And, yeah. So we prayed about it, and uh, it was it was clear that I needed to do this, and mm-hmm. I felt called to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, went through the RCIA program, was confirmed in 1990, and I've been a member of the Catholic faith ever since. Wow, and it, it has wow. been the best move I've ever made. Yeah. That's wonderful. Really. And you went, you went through St. Patrick's for your RCI? No, actually, we, I went through Holy Name, which oh. is now part of, we had, in the meantime, we had moved right before our son was born, we moved to Mullica Hill, okay. which is where we live today. Right. So, yeah. That's, That's wonderful. a funny image of the, I mean, at least the location was convenient for those five years. Yes. <laughs> well, it's funny because I lived in Woodbury for several years when my wife and I were first married. As a matter of fact, we were married at St. Patrick's Church in Woodbury. Okay. Oh, that's so, right. I when, knew that sounded familiar yeah. for some, yeah. So when you mentioned that, that that you went to the Presbyterian Church, my first thought was, man, I love that church. That's just a, it's such a pretty exterior. It's right on the main drag. It's yes. so nice. Have you I ever would, been in there before? I have. And oh. I would often get jealous because as a Catholic, <laughs> the Catholic Church is slightly off the main drag. It's, yes. not, it's down the road and I was like, man, I want our church on the main drive. This is terrible. They, they got they got rock star parking here with this church. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But that's so funny because yeah, they're like a, they're like a block away from each other, two yep. blocks away from each other. And it's it's a it's a, it is a great that church. Not to not to promote the Presbyterian faith, but whoa, whoa. well, my mother. <laughs> So my mother's side of the family were all Protestant. So right. she grew up. Her father actually changed uh, religion several times, but one of them was Presbyterian. Wow. And so about half of our family are still Presbyterians, and the, the other half converted to Methodist with my grandfather. I didn't know that. Wow. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. My side of the family is full. Actually, when he was telling the, the explanation, my dad's side of the family is all Italian and Irish, and the other side of the family, I'm a giant mutt. The entire side okay. of the family goes back to the you know Mayflower time. That's, oh that's my gosh. There. But those blend families are beautiful because I mean having come from a family like that yeah. I loved it because you get so many different perspectives yes. and, and it was a one, like your kids they're going to say so many different foods cause. well there are a, lot, are a lot of different foods as well but different um, perspectives no, but the right. Protestant side were all the hunters so I had a lot of venison and things like that <laughs> sure. and then the Italian side of the family was a lot of pasta so but, right. it, but, it's, but it's great and I love hearing stories about couples coming together yeah. that's, that's absolutely wonderful yeah right. And you know, it's so, funny, I, I, I just wanted to share too that one of the things about my childhood, my parents always loved to sit in the back row in the balcony, all the way, center mm. balcony, all the way in the back. Yeah. And it was far from the altar. And at the time, the, the uh, pastor of our church, his name was Reverend Richard Craven, uh, used to give these amazing sermons. And he had a booming voice. I mean, a bass voice that would, could have been on Broadway. Wow. But when he would speak, and you have to picture me at 8, 10, 12 years old, in the top row of the balcony, it was like God's voice is literally right over my head because of the echoing. Right. And I remember as a little boy thinking something was happening with me, but I didn't know what to do. It was, yeah. like, it was like, oh my gosh, that, that really sounds just like God. So right. it's funny how when people think about when did you actually hear God? I can go all the way back to them, but I don't. I don't think I realized I heard yeah. God speaking to me through him, through yeah. his sermons. But the place where I sat and the acoustics of it, it was. I can. Intense. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, that's what it, that's what going to a church is really supposed to feel like. I mean, all the way. You know, I'll often talk to our vicar general, uh, Father Robert Hughes, about you know church structures and how they're built and what they're intended to do. And they're really intended to. We can't perceive God on earth, but the churches were really intended to be built to give you this perception of what of what it would be like to be in the kingdom of heaven. And when you have a pastor that really knows how to. 
hit the ceiling yes. like that, yeah, sure. it only it adds to that. Yeah, exactly. Right. And we've, I mean, we, you and I have been around people who, the priests who are really good mm-hmm. speakers. Oh, yeah. And it really does make a big difference, which isn't to say that the quiet, humble ones don't, don't <laughs> no. also appeal to people, but you don't necessarily, sometimes the voice of God is a booming voice, and sometimes it's a little whisper. Yeah. That's so right. We accept all voices of God. Absolutely. But th- there is, you're absolutely right. There is something to say for getting yeah. that when you're y- young like that. Yeah, it makes yeah. a big difference. And the fact that you can pinpoint, you know, that exact time frame for some people it's more of like a, a journey but you yeah. you know you and felt I it back then i was recognizing something inside that i was feeling and at eight years old i didn't know what that yeah. was i probably right. went home and had a cheesesteak and watched the eagles yeah. and forgot about it as i got older <laughs> it began to be like it stayed with me i'm like okay what is this right, right? and we, we go through that part and i did too so. yeah so it sounds like your spirituality you really um you really brought it inside of yourself at, at a very early age and you know talking to Mary about uh, all the things you've done you've it seems that regardless of whether it was a Presbyterian spirituality or a Catholic spirituality it's stayed with you in all these other projects you've worked on over the years like so Mary wanted to talk about a couple of them sure yeah um Dave is one of those people who uh, you know you keep bumping into at the most unsuspecting times um I can think of you know your church welcomed our some of our refugees at Catholic Charities, and you know they spoke to some of the, your parishioners. Um, right. I've I remember seeing your face around Catholic Charities, but being so busy that I didn't really have time to say sure. hi. And then, yep. you know, most recently you became involved with a different volunteer program. So, can you talk a little bit about how you came to know about Catholic Charities and kind of your sure. involvement with it? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I can tell you specifically, uh, it was the election cycle 2016. You are good with dates, you know. <laughs> well, I, I came prepared. I made some notes because I gave it some thought. But um, uh, the story goes, I had recently joined our social justice ministry team in the parish the year before. Um, I had heard a lot about it. I was looking for something new to participate in. I had finished up a ministry with, um, in our parish. My term at pastoral council had ended, and there was something new, and, and I was invited to join. Um, one of the things that our social justice ministry team does is connect to Catholic charities for um, things that are happening within the whole diocese. You know, what can we be connected to? How can we grow? How can we make sure that what we're um, working on here in our parish is reflective of what's happening in the greater diocesan area. So I was given the opportunity to come in and meet Mike Jordan Lasky. Mm-hmm. And that happened right after the election. I'll never forget it because for the first time in our marriage, my wife voted Democrat and I voted Republican, meaning we voted differently. Right. We've voted differently before, but always the same. We moved back and forth, but we always voted for the same candidate. Mm-hmm. And I have to say to you that it was the beginning of a little bit of a journey for both of us yeah. where we, for the first time in our marriage, were like, wow, we're really not seeing eye to eye on this. What is going on here? Because we really never really had that kind of a challenge. And that was one of those elections where I think a lot of people felt the same way, where people really didn't see eye to eye. 100%. (laughs) Wow. So I came to see Mike with with an agenda to talk to him about social justice uh, ministry initiatives. And we had come up with the idea, uh, and Mike was great, and that's where I first met you, Mary, Mm -hmm. to have a... uh, panel discussion in our parish one evening um, that would be sponsored by our social justice ministry team, but led by the uh, members of the refugee resettlement program here in the diocese. Mm -hmm. So I came to talk to Mike about it to find out if there was interest. And we spent probably half of our one hour talking about what's going on in our marriage. And I thought it was really interesting (laughs) that Mike uh, explained to me about, I said, you know, Mike, there's got to be a way I said, uh, we're not the only couple that voted differently and probably going through some times right now that are frustrating mm-hmm. and, and uncertain. But we, there's got to be a way to bridge, uh, build a bridge between the two sides. And he sure. mentioned to me, he said, you know, the word pontiff means bridge builder. I said, I didn't know that. I thought it meant pope. Yeah. And I said That's to him, we could say. definitely have the pope at our dinner table tonight. We need the pope like <laughs> yeah, now, right? right? <laughs> so he laughed and he said, no, but think about that and, and building bridges. And, mm-hmm. and I thought it was a really interesting conversation because we, my wife and I both are very involved. If you looked at my resume and compared it to hers, it's nothing. Her her resume is what she does is <laughs> Mike, twice that's as why much. I said she can have her own podcast oh, another for sure. time. <laughs> for sure. So, um, but it was interesting because after about 30 years, we found ourselves like not really agreeing on this. Mm-hmm. So I've spent some time, and, and Anita has too, working on finding ways to build bridges, not only when we 
disagree with each other, but also to build bridges to other people in our diocese, in our parish, who we don't have a connection with. Mm -hmm. um, and one, through social justice ministry, that's one of the ways that we do it. Um, so we were able to have that refugee resettlement program panel discussion, which was wonderful. Uh, it taught us a lot about what refugees go through before they even get here. Right. And then the timing of things once they get here. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. How much familiarity did you have with refugee resettlement at that point? Because the, the parish you belong to now has a strong social justice uh, core to it. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, was this something, was this like a request that was coming from the parish or was this an opportunity to learn more? Because if people don't remember, 2015, 2016 was actually the high point of the refugee crisis, if you want to call it that, yeah. where if at that time is actually the first time I, I had come to the diocese in 2015, and it was my first interaction with Kevin Hickey, who's executive director, was when um, Governor Christie uh in an area that was outside of his purview and decided that he was going to limit all refugees coming to New Jersey. And he cc'd uh, three refugee providers uh, on his letter to the press, his, pub, his press release. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them was Catholic Charities of Camden, who was very surprised by this, as was all of the providers, because nobody knew he was about to say this, but it was part of his, at that time, it was part of his uh, campaign to for the presidency. Um, so obviously a lot of focus was immediately put on us and it was the first crisis that Kevin and I had had the opportunity to work on. He and I didn't necessarily see eye to eye on how to handle it at first, um, but at the end we, we really had a good, but it was I, that was the first time even I had gotten a part of the refugee program. Mm -hmm. So it's that, that was a very well-timed panel for you to have because at that time there was so little good information outside of yeah. what Catholic Charities was doing because it was, it, you know, it's not necessarily the kind of program you do a lot of publicity for because you're working with refugees specifically. It's not like we need to cultivate refugees from Salem County. We know that they're going to be coming from overseas. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a massive influx at that time yeah. from Syria, yeah. from uh, Myanmar, Burma, from several different countries. Yeah. Right. At that time, influx. do you remember, Mary, um, how many uh, refugees Catholic Charities was bringing in at that point? I want to say it was a couple of hundred a year. It was a couple hundred. Yeah. And it's now at zero. Well, changes it because um, it's administered through the the admin the federal government, and right. so there have been mm -hmm. changes to the policies in the last four years. Right, but um, that was a timely, you know. Uh, yeah, that was an incredibly beneficial time to have yep. it. So I'm curious, what was the reaction from the parish with what the Catholic Charities brought to you in terms of information in yep. the panel? Yeah, I think to answer your original question, Mike, I didn't know anything about it. I mean, it was one of those things when I signed up to join, it was like, okay, how can I help? Where, where do I fit in? Because this group had been formed for a while. Stacy Zach's a wonderful leader of our group. We meet every month on a Monday, the first Monday of the month, and we, we had until COVID. Um, and there were always things to be worked on, both right in our own parish to work with other ministries helping people, as well as in our county. And then, of course, the connection now was, OK, we got to get in connected to the diocese. So for me personally, I didn't know anything about it. It was received very well. Um, you know, one of the things that at the time it was Father Tony D. Bardino was our pastor. He and the other members, the leadership of our parish, really wanted us to understand that it's a lot bigger than just the boundaries of, a, of our towns or the parking lots of our churches mm -hmm. that we have to reach out to. And we do have a very vibrant and involved ministry team across the board in our right. parish. It's, it's pretty remarkable. We're very fortunate. So connecting all of those ministries, making sure that everybody knew what, how to be connected was important. And the social justice team was reaching out for the first time to a wider boundary mm -hmm. to connect to the diocese. To, it was fascinating for me to learn and really, in some ways, very humbling for me to be the point person to come back every month and say, hey, there, I'm learning a lot. There's a lot here to look at. There's right. a lot of videos to read. There's a lot of stories to hear. And there's a lot of need. So that's why we picked that topic for our discussion panel discussion that year yeah uh, and it took a lot of work to put it on but it was i was really happy we did it that was music to my ears to hear that a parish actually wanted to learn more you know because so many times i'm thinking you know there are so many stories here and i think that day you know there was somebody from iraq who yep. you know recently became a citizen there was a daca recipient there was yep. patrick barry whose mother was a refugee from Cambodia. It was a, a mix of people, all with very different stories. But yep. the fact that, 
your team, you know, showed an interest in listening to it. That was in the spirit of, you know, encounter and everything Pope Francis has been talking about. So, you know, we got so excited when <laughs> when we heard about that opportunity. And to, and to go back to sort of like the, the genesis of all that, you know, that really is certainly in Mary and my world, the communication and, and education is really what we do a lot of. Um, so we get very excited when the parishes want to come out because they're, you know, I remember a lot of the hostility that was going on during that time. Like we, we, we had concerns about whether people were going to be searching for our refugees to attack them. We were mm-hmm. worried about Molotov cocktails coming in through the Catholic Charities front door. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were a lot of things to, to be concerned about. It was a very hot button issue at the time. But it was at that time, uh, Mary and Kevin really ramped up um, making these panels available to people so that they could get to learn the true story of what these refugees really did go through, what the process really was like and just how safe it was for refugees to be invited because of the vetting process that goes on for refugees mm-hmm. to be invited to the to the um, to the states and into South Jersey and it wasn't necessarily and like a, and and just, as a, just as a side <laughs> note I, I often like to bring this up I live in a college town and so I have a lot of college renters all around me oh, if I had to choose be between fun. college renters all around me and uh, refugees all around me <laughs> I will fill the town with refugees because I've met these refugees and and yeah. the people that have come through Catholic Charities are the nicest, sweetest, most grateful, most hardworking people I have ever met in my entire it's life. It's true. It re- not a bad egg in the bunch that I've ever come across. Mm-hmm. And they're human. You know, that's right. another thing, too. Like, they they do demonstrate all of the things you just said, but they're also human. And that was part of the whole idea of, you know, this outreach, you know, not to necessarily make someone decide who they're going to vote for next time, but just, like, like you said, building a bridge um, just to get a better understanding and, you know, digest some of it. And that's so important. (laughs) There was a perspective that I gained, and I know many people on our social justice ministry team did, as well as parishioners. When you meet people who have come through the program and have suffered the way they have, it when we read scripture and we talk about Jesus' call to welcome the stranger, my perspective was totally changed mm-hmm. when I read that today mm-hmm. because of that experience. And right. so many other people have experienced it too. Literally, when I read it before, welcome the stranger, I thought they meant the person across the street who just moved in. Right. Yeah, sure. I think mm-hmm. that's what that's most my, people that's, would I think. could only really get that perspective around right. in my head. Okay, I need to be nicer. And I do. Mm-hmm. But when I saw this program and I realized what these people, these refugees are dealing with coming here and what they left and what they come here with, which is nothing, right? Um, that just created levels of understanding for Scripture, uh, Jesus' call that way. So, And that's really helped me in many ways. It's, it's given me additional perspective. And I know I speak for many members of our parish as well. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, you mentioned that there are no refugees coming into Catholic charities and for almost the entirety of the United States now for the last several years. I, from a personal perspective, of all the programs that have had to be shuttered and, and throughout the diocese for, for one reason or another, that's the one that's caused me the most pain personally, yeah. just because it, the, the, good, the good that it was doing for so many people and the good, quite frankly, it was doing for so many souls like mine, mm-hmm. um, you know, I would love to at some point see that program come back into yeah. action. You know, I know Hopefully I know it was hard it for you. I know it was hard for Kevin Hickey. I know it was hard for Patrick Barry. Yeah. It was hard for a lot of us. But um, you know what? That's a good segue into some of the volunteer work you've done since, such as the sure. Walk With Me mentorship program. Yeah. <laughs> can yeah, you sure. tell us about that? I sure can. Um, the uh, emergence of that actually comes from um, some time that I spent and still spend with a spiritual director uh, that I was directed to about eight years ago. Um, She's a Franciscan sister down in Aston, PA at Newman College. Her name's Sister Ann David Strominger. And I was introduced to her and invited to work with her in spiritual direction uh, years ago. And I found it to be extremely helpful and rewarding. Wow. Um, she's a great friend, a companion uh, in the spirit. And um, one of the things that I'd mentioned to you that when I was a little boy, I had these feelings inside when I was listening to Reverend Craven mm-hmm. give his sermons. Um, as we all experience something, there's, there's, there's something about hearing something or feeling something inside. It's not head, it's heart. Mm-hmm. But for me, that feeling was clear, but the direction of the feeling was vague. Yeah. And what Sister Anne has helped me work with is to kind of 
understand what's God asking of me when I have those types of encounters. And uh, it became very obvious after time uh, that I needed to go back and help somebody, help people, um, especially younger people, younger men, uh, because at the truth of the story is when I was a, a late teenager, early adult, uh, if I had not met my wife and dated her and been introduced to some very influential men in my life who helped direct me, shape me, mm-hmm. I'm not so sure where I'd be today. Uh, and I mean that in every aspect, yeah. as a husband, as a son, as a father, as a, uh, a child of God, as a business person, as a, as a Catholic in a parish. Um, I've had a, a half a dozen or so very influential, and I'll say men at that time, it's mm-hmm. interesting, I have Sister Anne now, <laughs> um, but back then, um, yeah. just, and, and again, being young and not really understanding what was happening to me, but I understood that I needed to change. I was, you know, some choices I was making weren't so good. Mm-hmm. Uh, boy, I look back now with 40 years of perspective and say, thank God. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely right. So, yeah. so the point is that uh, I wanted to pay that forward, and I didn't understand how I was being called to do that until maybe a year ago. Uh, and I was invited to uh, consider this program, the Walk With Me program. And today I'm, I'm able to work with a, a young man who's 13 years old who came here about uh, six years ago with his family from Syria and has uh, spent a lot of time traveling away from his home in, in Damascus. They had to leave because of all the strife and, and the war and the, and the poverty there. Um, so I've gotten to know him for about six months. It's been, it's been a challenge, a mm-hmm. real challenge at times. Yeah. I'm not going to kid anybody. Yep. But he is such a great kid, and their family's wonderful. And I really, get, again, talk about levels of perspective, right, to understand what it really means to mm-hmm. be a refugee. I'm, I've been in their house yeah. many times. We've I see bumped it. into each We've other eating each other. dinner for, you That's know, right. they have the beautiful dinner spreads every yes. time. <laughs> yes, it is uh, front and center for me right now. Boy, I got a front row seat to what yeah. the refugee yeah. families deal with. And yeah. Dave, you were the first person to volunteer for the um, Walk With Me mentorship program. There's more information on Catholic Charities' website. but Well, you know, I mean, instead of just saying, you want to give a little bit more detail to the to the program? Yeah, I should have thought of that before <laughs> <laughs> but um it's a program and christina chillum could sum this up much better than i can she's the one running the program but actually if you want to if you want to take the time you can look up christina's episode of the podcast where our, you were sick that, that day correct. actually and we had her on the podcast talking yes. about the program it, yep but if you don't want to go back and listen to it this is what the program's about <laughs> <laughs> it's um it's a program where we try to f- match up um, youth. Uh, initially, it was just um, boys and, and men, but match a, a youth who might be struggling a little bit, whether it's with, with grades, with friends, somebody, like you said, Dave, who could use more role models um, and somebody to just to talk to, um, feel comfortable around, and maybe just get some good advice from uh, that they might not otherwise get Um, and you know at first we had youth being referred to us but we didn't have anybody who was stepping up and saying I'm willing to um, to sign up to be a mentor for for these youth and uh, you know on one hand and I know this was something on Christina's mind it's it is asking a lot and it's there's a lot more to it than just you know spend an hour each week, go home, um, not think about it, then show up the next week. You know, there's, I'm sure you know, Dave, like there's a lot of just time, effort, planning. Um, but we, so far, a lot of people who have said what, what you've said, it's challenging, it's rewarding. Um, and it's a great program for people who, you know, of course the youth who, who could use mentors, but for mentors to kind of like you phrased it pay it back um or just offer whatever gifts and talents they have to somebody who needs them so you know it's a win-win that's what we aim for (laughs) you know both of you said talked about challenges without getting into specifics to these specific challenges like what would you describe as some of the challenges sure uh one would be um in the particular house family that i work with in their house 
the young man that I'm working with who's 13 speaks the best English. Oh. So mm-hmm. speaking the best English at times makes him the adult in the room. Yeah. And that's a challenge. Um, um, even communicating things like my wife keeps saying to me, Dave, stop. You have to be careful when you speak to the family. You have to make sure that you're using elementary words because I talk like I'm talking to you right, right now. And I, I've got to check myself. So a challenge would be I have to think before I speak. And I don't often do that. Yeah. I speak and then I think. Um, don't we all? <laughs> um, those are a couple of things. Communication, like I said, is one. I think the other is just the dynamic that actually the, the 13-year-old who's the oldest child in the house actually speaks the best English. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'll be looking at forms that come home from school to fill out about him that his mm-hmm. parents. Are. So I'll ask them to hold them till I get there. Let me go through it. Let yeah. me help you finish it mm-hmm. uh, and fill it out. So um, that that's one. That's really great, actually. And that's, I mean, that, I mean, yes, a challenge, absolutely. But yeah. I, I think the that's... family has raved about you. I stay in touch with them, <laughs> and they do really love you. I was going to say, I, I, think, I think they're too. getting some value add out of that if you're, uh, if you're taking care of the document work it's, too. So. It's a, oh, for sure. No, no question. And uh, just yeah, another Anita story. When we get into math, and we need to help uh, uh, the seventh grader with his math. It's not me. I'm like, okay, hold on. I'm not sure. Anita, <laughs> oh, no, I'm on FaceTime tables. video. I'm like, Anita, can you? And she jumps right in. And we've had more than one session. And, and I'm taking notes, too, because I'm learning again seventh grade math. It's so. all the new math. It's nothing like we had. Yeah, Amen to that. That's true. <laughs> the, uh, no, it's, I was so impressed, you know, when I remember sitting down with you um, because our, our volunteer coordinator at the time, I think, was sick that day. So yes. it was you, me, and Christina Chillum. Right. She said, can you just fill in and kind of get a feel for... And then I saw, oh, my gosh, that's Dave. Like, you know, yep. and we, we both were just... I hadn't seen you since we were in the parish. Right. right. Yeah. And Christina and I were just so impressed by, you know, the questions you had and, you know, you admitting, you know, I don't know if this is something... I'm 100% sure of right now, you know, I have to think about it and pray about it. But the fact that you took the initiative to come forward before anybody else did, you know, we were very impressed by that. You know, and I often wondered, you know, what led you to that? And I'm, I'm yeah. glad to hear the story behind it. Well, you know, it's interesting because so we had Christina on for that episode, probably almost a year ago, I would imagine. And, um, you know, I've certainly helped out trying to promote this program a little bit. And certainly Mary's been working a lot on doing that, as well as Christina. And it has had a hard, we've had a hard time getting traction. I wonder, could you speak to other men maybe right now and tell them what, sure. tell them really what you get out of it and sure. why, why it, it's so important to the young, young men? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I find myself at 61 years old and an empty, my wife and I are empty nesters, uh, extremely blessed to be in that position because I know a lot of parents at my age are not. Um, but I have nothing but time. No. Uh, where do I want to spend my time on? I mean, I enjoy the Eagles games on Sunday like every other Philadelphian. <laughs> I love to dabble in cooking. I play some tennis. Yeah. I have a business that I run with my wife's family. But we have such a, a wonderful team around us that it affords me opportunities like today to be with you mm-hmm. and not in the office and having to work you know, 10-hour days, yeah. uh, five, six days a week. So what do I do with that time? And as I said to you before, I just feel so blessed to have had the journey I've had and to have been guided the way I was. Uh, for those men out there who are looking for something to, that would be a way to uh, respond to God's call, um, to give some of your time and talent to a young man who uh, doesn't quite have the same guidance that, mm-hmm. that you or I may have had when we were you know, 13 to 18 years old, it is a remarkable uh, uh, ministry. Uh, as I said, I'm kind of new in it. It's only been about six months, yeah. and I'm stumbling at times. And which and is normal. Thank goodness you... I'm with a 13 year old <laughs> who, who can kind of let things go. At the, you know, okay, that's fine. Um, uh, but it is it is a remarkable opportunity. It's a great program. There are there are many. I'm sure there's many boys out there that could use a big brother. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's similar to the big brother program. Yeah, mm-hmm. and but it's ages to nine for, to. I think 17. So, you know, we try to match people appropriately depending on what age, you know, they, I guess, would feel more comfortable And as I recall with. from what Christi- Christina told me, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly um, uh, 
depth, there's a lot of depth to the interviews that go on before the matching occurs. Oh, so, yeah. So Background she, checks, interviews, yeah, all sorts so, of stuff. I mean, there, there is some paperwork, and I have to imagine even someone who maybe was looking for some time to fill, that I had to have to believe there was some trepidation before yes. you, you took this on, because sure. it's, a, it's a great responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd like to believe, certainly hearing the non-challenging parts of the story, it, it sounds like you're truly enjoying it. And, yes. And he's getting something out of it as well, right? Mike, it's a gift to me. I'm, yeah. Um, and one of the other things that I would say, everything that I've given, is in the end, it's really not me giving, it's me receiving. That's the truth, and I know we all know how that works. Yeah. That's the truth, again, for the 20th time in my life. Right, you know? right. I'm not, you know, okay, yes, I did sign up to do this. I do set up the time we get together. I did fill out the paperwork. I do the reports mm-hmm. to Christina every month. We have our challenges I've got to work through, but... In the end, even six months into it, I'm the receiver in yeah. this relationship. Um, and to tell you another quick story, um, uh, the young man that I work with, one of the things that he said he wanted to do was do better in school through mm-hmm. this program, mentoring. What do you want to do? I want to get better grades, okay? Well, I'm 61 years old. I'm kind of set in my way, so there's only one way to get better grades. You've got to work harder. We're gonna, you're going to study more. You're going to hit the books. Uh, and he wants to talk about playing Fortnite. Oh, my god! Which, which I, know that, I know of it, but I don't know what yeah, it is. Right. So we're in the car early on, maybe the second or third week we're together, and we're going out to get some ice cream. And I'm like, okay, now listen, here's what we're going to do. The most important thing is you need to get a library card. He's right around the corner from the local library. After school, when you've got work to do, if it's not a day I'm going to see you, I want you to go to the library, sit down, read your assignments, do your homework, get ahead of your work, right? Yes. I'm all fired up for a library card. And just by osmosis, I get him fired up for a library card. Now, we're driving. <laughs> he's thir- At the time, he's 12. We're driving to go get ice cream. And I said, so that's it. So it, it was a Saturday, I think. So the library opens again on Monday. He says, on Monday, I'm going in to get a library card. I said, that's great. And then there's <laughs> silence as we drive. And about a 30 seconds later, he looks at me and goes, how do you get a library card? <laughs> so challenges, right? I'm thinking like I'm right. like an adult who's confident going to walk in. How do I get a library card? And this right. 13-year-old boy needs somebody to, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I need to go you with don't you. Even think <laughs> you don't even think of. So, <laughs> You know, also, you, could you mentor my son because he's 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 twelve right now, and I think he, and I'm like I want to do better at school, and I need him to. It's, it's, I think all twelve year olds are the same way. If I if I'm willing to guess, that. I think you're so, right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. You did, I I think I mentioned this earlier, Dave, but it's you know you're involved with so much between this program. I know. Um, you work. Can you tell us just briefly about your professional life too? Because sure. this was interesting. I wanted sure. to touch uh, on it. So uh, I mentioned to you that I met my wife in 1978. My father was working at the company Crescent Ironworks in Philadelphia. We fabricate steel and ornamental metals for the general contracting business in the Philadelphia area. Um, he was a salesman working for my future father-in-law. And when I was uh, 18, my dad asked me in the summer, "Would you want to get get a job working? I could see if they need any summer help." And uh, I said, sure. So I interviewed with the two owners of the company, Albert and Joe, who Albert became my father-in-law and Joe's uncle wow. Joe. Uh, at the time, I was uh, walked in and, you know, what would you, you know we, have, we have a need for somebody. We call them a gopher. They have to get mail. They have to make blueprints and get our lunch. And I said, I think I have the qualifications. <laughs> they said, do you have a driver's license? I said, yeah. I said, you're, they said, you're hired. All right. So the first week I worked there, uh, learning the ropes, you know, trying not to mess up. It's my dad's boss that just hired me. This I hear rumblings around the office. There's a, oh, Anita's going to be coming in. Anita, Anita. I'm like, who's Anita? Oh, it's Albert's daughter. She's going to help out in the accounting department, bookkeeping, because she's really good at math. And to this day, she's Good yeah. the story. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I married an accountant. I understand. Yeah. You know. I was about to yes. say <laughs> so uh, that uh, the first day that Anita started, we we met. I happened to ask her if she needed anything for lunch, and and my story says she was smitten at the very minute I said that. Uh-oh. There's probably a different version out there. <laughs> but anyway, we became great friends for the summer, working together every day, and then uh, ultimately started dating yeah. Labor Day weekend. Oh. Uh, so the company today is uh, 90 years old. Started wow. by my wife's grandfather in 1931 who came over from Italy 10 years before because there was no work 
Uh, he and two of his partners uh, formed the company, uh, like I said, 1931. And today it's in, it's going into its fourth generation with my son wow. and uh, oh. my partner, Anita's cousin's son-in-law, that are going to run it when we retire. Uh, we have about 80 employees over three different co- uh, companies that are now in the same footprint of the building that I started in with her in 1978. So. That's that is amazing. About six family members run the company today. I love wow. hearing about family-owned companies. I was just I, thinking that. And I love that. it when they I'm stay like in the family. That's, that's so yes. wonderful. That's and you great. know, Mike, just to, to, to finish that up, the most important part of my three-pronged job at the beginning, mail, go for anything they need, and lunch, yeah. they're all Italian. It was lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I had to have Priorities. the skill to get the order right, get it on time, don't mess up. Boy, uh-huh. I'll tell you, I... I'm oh, sweating I, just I thinking about you. that. I <laughs> I miss that. Like I, you can tell that's old school. Have, go for jobs. Those are I, and those are I'm the sorry, best. I'm sorry. Gopher. Gopher. Yeah. You have to go, go for, for this. stuff. Okay, I'm go thinking this, of the animal. That. Okay. No, 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 I'm no, glad we. G O F O G O F O R was gopher. Yeah. So I'm thinking. Yeah. They, they would page me like, Dave. Yeah, listen. I need you to run down to the bank. There's a letter that has to be picked up at Eighth and Bainbridge. And I'm from South Jersey. I'm like, what's a Bainbridge? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? So, but I found my way after a few challenging. <gasps> That's a riot. Days. That's outstanding. The wow. um, but the family, but the family uh, was on the main line. It was uh, right outside of St. Joe's, right? Yeah, was where you're. Yep. Over, you, I guess the Overbrook section. The Overbrook Overbrook section. Park. That's our alma, yeah. Alma yeah, and we were actually married in that parish at Our Lady of Lords. It's That's a wonderful. Special place wow. for us even today. Yeah. I love That's that. Amazing. Yeah. And I want to get to um, a question because we talked about it before, but. Um, can you can you tell us about your family too? I know sure. you mentioned a couple of your family members, and sure. then I want to ask you that question, which I can't wait to hear about. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> sure. So my wife and I have three children. Uh, our son Chris is 31, and he's the fourth generation. Uh, our son Chris works at Crescent. Uh, he's married to Gina, friends with Christina from college, and they have two children. I'm a grandfather, which is the absolute joy of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, Milo is almost three, and oh. Sienna's one, uh, and they are just wonderful. They live in Sewell, and uh, my so, uh, my daughter Jenna is 28 years old and lives in Brooklyn, and she works. She graduated from Hofstra, has always loved the theater, was a theater major, uh, loves New York City, loves the theater, and is actually part of a uh, uh, on the keys is a um, production company that she's a member of, a small production company that puts on shows remotely these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, And she also works full-time for a women's uh, subscription clothing company. Mm, Uh, And she's having a a great time in New York. She's a a sweetheart and a joy, my daughter. And then our youngest son, Will, is 25, and he is a physics teacher at Boys Latin in Baltimore. Oh, wow. Uh, Wow. And he he went to the University of Maryland, uh, decided to be a physics major, but through the education program, and they brought him right in and said, physics, male, you're going to be a yeah, teacher, and yeah. he wanted to be a teacher. So, so. he got those genes from your wife. Uh, yes. The number of genes, okay. <laughs> Absolutely, my. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so awesome. funny. Yeah. And which always leads me to the question, you know, you're a grandfather, you're a father, you work, you mentor, you're a big part of your parish. Like I said at the beginning, you're kind of everywhere. How do you have time for all of this, <laughs> Dave? Uh, smoke and mirrors, I would say. <laughs> Anita is shaking her head at home right now saying, he's really not that busy, Mary. Uh, Well, I do, I mentioned to you that I do love to be prepared. um, Mm -hmm. And I have a a little uh, story I could tell you about that. But, and again, one of the things that I learned that, right, I talked about being in in an impressionable age and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, where is the value in time spent, right? What, What can I be doing? Believe me, Mary, I love laying on the sofa, watching TV, at my age, naps on Saturdays are yes. really important. Got to have a nap. Um, you know, and I do have plenty of social time, although today it's mostly Zoom. Mm-hmm. Um, but that balance, I learned. You know, I was taught by people who you play hard and enjoy yourself, but you also give of yourself. And, and make sure that you're taking care of what you have to take care of. What are your priorities, right? So, so through God's grace, through leadership, through prayer, through my wife, always my wife, always, always my wife. Those things became aligned as I as I got older and matured. I'd hit my head once in a while, bang! Oh, no, no, that's not the right thing. Right. And you kind of reset, reset. So now at sixty one, I've probably got it organized pretty good. You know, I'm not saying I'm there yet, but does that make sense? I don't <laughs> Absolutely. know. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. So I have another what thirteen years to get it right. All right. So I got I got time. That's, but I'm a slow learner, Mike. So you probably have three. Oh, nuts. <laughs> 
No, organization has always been uh, my great uh, failing. Actually, it's that I'm. I'm Me too. I am very much a um, in case of emergency. Break glass. I could crisis <laughs> communications. Things. Right. I had something happen in the middle of something we were running last night, a live stream last night, and all of a sudden I get a media call and I'm juggling things simultaneously. That I'm great with. Planning ahead. It's a it's a very difficult skill set and one that I really never have possessed particularly well. So it's. I don't know about that, Mary. You and I have now worked together for four years. You've seen how I've had to wing it every now and again. But you can <laughs> wing it successfully. Yeah, I, can I wing cannot. It. The problem if is I, I can't don't prepare, plan it. I am done for. The well, so, so that's what's actually. So as we're having this conversation around my conference table outside of my office, um, I'm looking at Mary, who has done a diligent job, and she's the only host of Talking Catholic who actually writes down her questions and thinks about what she's going to talk about. Dave, she sent them to Dave. Dave, God bless him, actually wrote down his answers in quite nice penmanship and a yes. – in a notebook ahead of him. <laughs> with and the I questions was, that he with printed With the original out. <laughs> questions. And I was uh, quite literally running in with my hair on fire from a it's meeting, true. from a from a walkthrough setup that we were doing. And we get all the stuff set up in like three minutes. So we all have our own skills. No sets. paper in front of Mike. No, nope, you know. no paper but in front of me. you still sound better than I do on these podcasts. So. That's just because I've kissed the Barney Stone, which I haven't. I, actually, was, I really wanted to say I was just going to say I'm jealous because I have to go through all this and look at you. That's it's <laughs> it's – I. And see, that's the grass is always greater. I would much rather be more organized, but I'm not. The um, but you know, it's it's true. You know, uh, I think what we've heard today, in addition to the, the deep spirituality that you have, that was formed in the Presbyterians and carried forward in the in the Catholic world, um, you know, is. You know, these things we learn as young people, and it's it's a lifetime of education. So in your mentorship, here's a here's a 13-year-old now who is going to get, you know, so Damascus is in Syria. The the Syrian people, as, as Mary knows quite well, um, prior to the, the civil war that broke out, it was a very Western culture. It was uh, um, pretty much everything you would see in our daily lives in the United States was very similar that you would see in Syria. Um, and then the Civil War broke down. All those norms fell apart. Mm -hmm. And it was so easy for people to fall within the, between the cracks, in particular with so many people dying all around them. Right. Um, and here's a kid who got a, and his family who got an opportunity for a second chance coming here, coming into contact with Catholic charities and Catholic charities providing all the refugee work, but then also having the secondary program, which wasn't part of the refugee program. Right. The, the, the mentorship program is a program that goes in and of itself. It wasn't necessarily designed to work with the refugees. Um, but here's this perfect overlap right. where now you come into play because of your knowledge of uh, four years ago in, in 2016, learning about the refugee panel, where all this stuff comes together. So, you know, I say all this stuff to say that, you know, I don't ever expect everybody to get everything done once or everything done correctly once. But, you know, our lives are, are – we're constantly learning. We're constantly coming into contact with new things. Yep. You know, here's Dave at 61 who's trying something completely new out for the first time, even though he does seem to be a very gregarious guy. Um, <laughs> I suspect he would have done mentorship in a non-formal uh, way at some point. I'm sure he's mentored a lot of people <laughs> oh, in his life, I just never by imagine. title. <laughs> But here's a guy who's. I mean, you could be, you could be, you could be down at your fourth home uh, in in Hilton Head, but instead you're taking the time to work with a refugee, a refugee and a refugee family by extension to yeah. to bring some in addition to everything else. Too. Yeah, to bring some good work. And you know, I really am very impressed by stories like that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I hope our listeners, you know, really really get a lot out of that. Um, now, wait, was there one more question you wanted to ask? There was, and it kind of ties into what we were just talking about. But if if you had to, what was the best advice you've ever received? Can sure. you share it with us? Sure, I can. Absolutely. Um, th there's two levels to it. You know, I was speaking levels. The, the In the level of business in school, I always talked about how valuable it was for me to learn to be prepared. And there was a quote from Abraham Lincoln you may be familiar with where he said, if you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'm going to spend the first four sharpening my axe. Mm -hmm. Oh, I let mm. Right. That's a I got to grieve that in stone and put it in front of my um, desk at me, work. <laughs> marry, marry me too. I had to learn that yeah. because of so many examples in my life where I just didn't do something right or couldn't do something because I didn't take the time to prepare. Right. So, and, and in some ways, in a, in a grander scheme, 
you know, I feel like I'm being called to to prepare. My whole life should be a preparation of paying back the gift that I have from God, of first of all, of Jesus dying for my sins, mm -hmm. and second of all, all the blessings I have. So I should be prepared to give it back, give back as much as I can. Right. The second thing from a personal and spiritual side is to learn to be humble, right? It's not about me. Um, again, thinking of how blessed I am and, and from the moment I was born and raised in that church in Woodbury to meeting my wife, to all the blessings I've had from, from learning to be the gopher to now being the vice president right. of sales. And it just, you know, know, know who you are, understand that that's a total gift, a total gift. Yeah. Be humble, right? So I'm working with that. I'm a, I'm a second grade student in the in the class of humility. I, I've got a ways to go to graduate, but it's, so it's, does it's Mike. In, it's so in my we'll, we're tucking this away. Yes, but we, he and I understand that we need to learn more about humility. So that's, that's, that's oh, important. So that's very important. No, you're very humble. <laughs> that's very yeah. important. It, it is true. It is true. Actually, it's funny. You were just talking about the quotes. I have a quote thing on my my board out there. I'm absolutely writing down the Abraham Lincoln quote right now <laughs> yep. because yeah. it's it's important. You know, sharpening your axe. Be humble. Be prepared. That's yeah. right. Well, Dave, thank you very much for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure. Mary, thank you very much for asking Dave to be a part of this. And listeners, My thank pleasure. you very much for uh, downloading or logging in or listening on the radio to us. We very much appreciate it. And we'll be talking to you again next week. See you, everybody. Bye.